what I feel like we need to do. I think I'm on, not off screen. There I am. We're going to sing this one more time. Something's got to break. Something's got to break. As I look out and I see every individual sitting in this sanctuary, every individual in this sanctuary has something in their life that has to break. It might be the fact that you're praying for a, a loved one, a family member. It might be the fact that you have some kind of sickness in your body. It might be the fact that you're in a desert. You've been in the desert so long, you do not know what it is to talk to God any longer. But something has to break. And this is what I want you to do. If that is you, I don't care who you are. I don't care what your name is. If that is you, we, we have to show God that we are surrendered to his power and to his will in our life. And the way that we surrender is we lift our hands. We lift our hands and say, God, I want you to be God in my life. And this is what I want you to do as they sing this song. If you believe in the power of God, if you believe he is the one that has created you and can speak all things back the way they're supposed to be in your life, if you believe he is the all-powerful, omniscient, if you believe he is the one that can change the trajectory of your life, what I need you to do right now is I need you to don't look to the left, the right, who's in front of you, who is participating. But what I need you to do is I need you to lift your hands. I need you to say, God, I submit and surrender myself unto your power. Because when you surrender yourself unto his power, the walls begin to fall. Something will begin to break in your life. But when we sit here and we say, God, I'm going to worship you in my way. God, I'm going to worship you in the quietness of my room. You're telling God you cannot surrender in front of in front of people. You cannot surrender when he is moving within the house. I'm telling you right now, if you need a miracle in your life, you need to put your hands up. If there's something you've been asking God for and you have not seen the fruit of that prayer, you need to lift your hands up. If you're asking God to deliver you from something, no matter what it is, no matter how many times you've asked him, how many times you have promised him, you would never go back to what that was. You need to lift your hands and surrender to him and let him move in your life. Y'all begin to sing this. Y'all begin to sing it. Something has to break. You might not know what to pray. to break. So what you need to do in your right self. Now in your name. Something's got to break, God. Something has Something's got to break, God. Something has Something's got to break, break, God. I'm in your way, Father. Something has, Something has to break, break God. Something right has to break. Something has to break. Something has to break. the power of Jesus Christ. We claim victory. We claim victory. We claim victory. We claim victory. Victory is ours. In the name of Jesus. Father, you see every heart. Father, you see every mind. Father, you see every life. Father, you see every battle. Father, you see every defeat. Father, you understand what they feel and what they're going through. Right now, God. I'm asking you, Lord. 
to fight the battle we will walk in defeat no matter how polished we are no matter how good we sound no matter how much money we give God is not looking for that he is looking for men and women that will open their hearts to allow him access to their life That is how you get the victory. That is how you get the victory. You see, I know some things going on in the congregation. I get phone calls. Rebecca gets phone calls. We understand some of the battles that you're going through. We understand some of the valid fights that we do and we, and we put up for our loved ones and for ourselves. doesn't matter and it will not make a difference if you would not surrender yourself to what he's asking you to do. If you don't surrender yourself and lay down what he told you to lay down. But somebody said, well, that's stupid. It, it, it's dumb to lay that down. It, 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 that's how I got ahead. Exactly. That's how you got ahead. He's asking you to lay it down at the foot of the cross allow him access to your life access that you've never allowed him when we give our lives to Jesus Christ truly and fully that very first time there's something that happens inside of us and then years and years of battles and hurt and disappointments begin to come in and our hearts become like stone again if I get to my message the Bible says through the prophet that he's going to change your hearts of stones into hearts of flesh. That he can begin to write himself upon you. So you can understand what it is. We no longer have to walk around with the callousness of a spirit that, that are only holding on to the disappointments in our life that, that are holding us down. 
We can lay that down and allow the the Spirit of God and the life of God to move through us so that we can become soft again and pliable again and teachable again. You know the worst thing about an immature Christian and a very mature Christian? The immature Christian, the young Christian is teachable. They know they have no idea what the answers are and they are grabbing and trying to. But you know what happens to a seasoned Christian? You already have the answers. You don't need to listen to nobody else. You don't need to listen to this preacher up here screaming and spitting everywhere. You don't need to listen to somebody else online. You know where to go. And you know what that tells me? It tells me your heart has become hard. And you're not allowing God to move again. Most men do not, and most women do not get behind this desk because it's easy. We get behind this desk because we've been caught. We have a heart to see people changed. We have a heart to see people fall in love with Jesus Christ. We know what it is to to walk in defeat. We know what it is to have that weight upon our shoulders. And all we want is for people to understand there is a God that has not forgotten you. He knows you where you are. You're not walking by yourself. You're not walking by yourself. But so many times, if Josh represents God, so many times we're walking with God right here. Don't get in my bubble. Come with me. Don't get in my bubble. And that's how we keep God at arm's length. Stay right there, God. I I want you. I, I love looking at you. I love seeing you. But you need to stay right there. There's some things that if you get too close, you're going to smell the stench of my sin. You're going to smell the stench of my failures. We reverse the roles and I'm God and God says, I don't care about your stench. Don't you realize I gave my son to wash away all of that? I'm not going to walk away and walk with with arms linked. I'm going to walk and when you can't walk no more, I'm going to hold you up. And when you think you have no more strength, I'm going to carry you. So when you think you're by yourself, you're not by yourself. You're seeing me walk in your footsteps, taking you to where I need you to go. Somebody needs to understand that. God gave me a message called the reality of Christmas and I'm going to get to it I might give you an abbreviated version but but there's some things in there that we have to understand church we can come and we can play all we want we can check the box we can double check it if we taught a lesson that day triple check it if we gave our, our tithe we can quadruple check it if we gave an offering on top of the tithe God's going to look down at that checklist and he's going to say I don't see the box where you opened your heart to me I don't see the box where you opened your heart to me I had something very special planned for you today but all you was worried about was checking the boxes and you went right past the most important thing Open in your heart to me. Open in your heart to me. How many times have you read in the Old Testament where the Israelites just walked and walked and walked and had battle after battle after battle because they refused to open their hearts to the living God? Church, you want revival in your life? Church, you want things to happen in your life? It only happens when you open your heart to Him. You have to open your heart no matter how vulnerable it might make you feel. Men, I understand. We don't want to be vulnerable. We got to be tough. We got to be strong, ready to fight the battle when it comes, ready to to fight the enemy. But you show me a man that's not afraid of crying, I'll show you a man that will win every battle he ever goes up against. Strong men cry. Want me to prove it? The Bible says in John... Jesus wept. Jesus wept. There's no stronger man that ever walked this earth than Jesus Christ. He's not afraid to cry. 
He's not afraid to, to be vulnerable to his father to do the things that nobody else would do. He's not afraid to be the only one walking down the road and everybody throwing things at him. He's not afraid of it. Because he understood why he was here. Do you understand why you're here? We're going to transition into the message. We'll take up offering at the end of service. And do not leave. There's a special thing that Brother Rick is going to do. And I want you to be a part of that. But I feel like right now is the time for us to transition into the word. And I believe God's got a, a message for you. God is a wonderful, wonderful God. There is something about his presence when it comes into the room. Things change. You can, you can feel when things begin to shift away from our own abilities into where God begins to take over. There is something about the power of God. If we will just allow him to move in our lives. If you have your Bibles, we're eventually going to make it over to Matthew chapter 11. God gave me a word. The reality of Christmas. We're right in the middle of our Christmas season. Next week is going to be a phenomenal week and you don't need to miss it. We're going to have missionary Dr. Wang here. And I'm pretty sure I'm messing up his name. But he, I talked to him briefly this week on the phone and he's full of fire he's full of he is ready to come and to tear the walls down and i believe he's going to bless you you need to come with an open heart bring somebody that does not know jesus christ next week do not proselyte do not ask your good baptist friend to come to the church don't ask your non-denominational friends to come to the church. What you need to do is, it's Saturday before you come up here, before you do anything, walk around Walmart or, or Winn-Dixie and see somebody that needs Jesus and say, hey, I'll buy you lunch tomorrow if you come to church with me. There's a guy that's going to come. He's, a, he's a, a missionary that stands about this tall, and he's got to work for you. You know, sometimes if we... Show them that we care more than just asking them to come, giving them a card. They're more likely to come. We are here to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And I need you to be a part of that. At the end of service, I'll give you some announcements. So please don't run off. But as, as we get into the reality of Christmas, we have to understand that when we think about Christmas, some of us have great memories as a child. Some of us, maybe not so much. I know a lot of things begin to happen later on in life. So some of the things that I might have, have celebrated during Christmas, maybe some of the older generation did not because it did not make it into your childhood. But there was something about Christmas, no matter who you are, no matter what you believe, when you know you had some presents under a tree and you're going to get to open them on a particular day, there was some anticipation about getting to that gift. There was some anticipation about opening up and seeing what you have. We drop messages here and there to our parents and grandparents and our uncles. Hey, I, man, it should be cool if I got this Christmas. Should be cool if I got that. Then after you drop that, you, you sit back and you wait for Christmas to come to see if you got that. There's something about the anticipation. When you go to the Old Testament, that same feeling is throughout the whole Old Testament. There is something about the Old Testament writings and how they long for someday to happen. Someday the Messiah will come. Someday God will put everything right. Someday God's reign on earth will begin. Someday it will happen. Someday it's going to happen. Someday we'll be cleansed and forgiven. Someday captives will be set free. Someday. In the Old Testament, all they could say was someday. 
Oh, they went to the temple and they gave their sacrifices, hoping things were going to happen. All, all in, the, in a foreshadowing of the Messiah that was coming because God said he would. And they gave all kind of messages and prophecies. Someday, someday I'll never have to kill this goat again. Someday I'm not going to have to kill this sheep and this lamb again. Someday the Messiah will be here. And throughout the whole Old Testament, this is what you get. We can find some of that. If you go to Isaiah chapter 35, it says, Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be open, the ears of the deaf be unstopped, then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Where there was no life, there's going to be life. And as you read this, you have to understand the verbiage within this verse, in this passage. Everything is will. Everything is future tense. It's not happening now, but it's going to happen. Someday... This will take place. Someday we'll be free. Someday blinded eyes will be opened. Someday the lame will leap. Someday those that would have never shouted before are going to shout praises of joy unto the king of kings. Someday. And then you drop down to Isaiah chapter 61. Probably my favorite verse of the whole Old Testament. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. There's a, there was a shift from verse 35, uh, chapter 35 to chapter 61. Isaiah began to shift from someday to standing within the present as he saw God giving to him this word. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. It is a present tense verb. It is happening right now. This is what Isaiah was telling the people. You know, they always say when you read the book of Isaiah, it's like a blueprint into the whole Bible. 66 books in the Bible, 66 uh, chapters in Isaiah. And it pretty much mirrors what the Bible says in different ways. Isaiah was saying, it is here. The Messiah is here. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is here. And he was speaking this to a people that were going to be exiled. Speaking this to a people that were prisoned. Speaking this to a people that had blinded eyes and their ears could not hear what the spirit of the Lord was saying. But Isaiah was speaking to them. He was trying to tell them what was going on in both of these occasions. The Messianic prophecies, the signs of what the Messiah would do when he come was spoke. He will open. I am opening. He will do. I am doing. Someday these predictions would come true. What an incredible day that will be. Today we're going to look at probably... Not necessarily a story within the Bible that you would put in Christmas. But it's a great way to look at it. When you go to Matthew chapter 11, you find a very familiar story that you all know. You find John the Baptist in prison. After he gave an ear lashing to Herod for the way he was living his life and the things that he was doing. He says, you're not going to disrespect me. I'm going to throw you in jail. John says, I don't care. I'm not bowing down to you. And here goes John. We know that he was one of these crazy prophets that did what God wanted him to do. He spoke the truth and didn't care what happened. He was going to speak it. He wasn't going to water it down. He was going to speak it because he knew the word of God was going to change lives. If you have your Bibles, we're going to read a few verses. Starting at verse 2, it says, When John was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah. Now remember, this is after he had baptized Jesus. After he saw the Spirit of God come down and rest upon his head. After he said, here comes the Lamb of God. After all of this. Now he's in prison. And we get to this part of the scripture. And it says, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect to see someone else? He sends his disciples to speak to Jesus. I know you're the Lamb of God. You know, I saw the Spirit of God. But are you the Messiah? Are you the one? 
Students, disciples, go and ask. Jesus replied to them in verse 4. Go back and report to John what you have heard and seen. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Jesus said, listen, I'm not going to tell you I'm the Messiah. But this is what I want you to do. Go back and tell John everything you've heard and everything that you see. You make the decision yourself. You go back. When you begin to look at this, John's in prison and he sends his disciples to speak to Jesus. Jesus responds to their questions by listing the things that he has been doing. The blind see now. The lame are walking. The lepers are are healed. They're cleansed. The deaf ears are open. The dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to all of the poor. It's amazing. This is the stuff only God can do. This is the stuff that they hoped for, and they anticipated. When they begin to listen and begin to see everything Jesus is doing, I bet you they went back to Isaiah and said, wait a second. He said, he will be able to do this, and he he will. But then Isaiah said that that the Spirit of the Lord is on him, and and he is doing this. Now we're seeing that there's somebody here that is doing this. There's something about the anointed of God that is standing before them, and he's not saying that I'm I'm, I'm, I'm God's son. He's not saying it. He says, watch, listen, and go and report back. You make your own mind up. And this is how it is when you come to church. When you, when you do your thing and you live your life for God. Oh yes, yeah, somebody can come up and tell you this. But you have to listen. And you have to watch what's happening around you and allow God to speak to you. To open your heart up to Him. Let it be pliable yet again. So He can move upon you. You see, the stuff that He's doing is consistent with all the verses we just read in Isaiah. But notice there's one thing that Jesus leaves out. When he's talking to the disciples. He completely omits. God's vengeance. Whoa wait a second. Wait a second. What do you mean God. He left out God's vengeance. Read it, read it for yourself. Read what Jesus Christ said to the disciples. Report back to John what I'm doing. Didn't I say one thing about vengeance. Or retribution. Didn't say anything about that. Report the things that I'm doing. When Jesus stands in the tabernacle in the synagogue in Luke chapter 4 and, re, and he quotes this, as now it has been fulfilled within your sight and he closes the book. Even then, he didn't say anything about God's vengeance. Vengeance is not part of God's eternal character. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 32 says, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. You mean even the ones that come against, even the ones that don't believe, even the ones that curse me? Scripture says he has no pleasure in the death of anyone. He understands what the final death holds. He understands what's there. He understands how pitiful it's going to be for those that have to live that. Because remember, you're not going to die. You will live in eternity somewhere. Either rewarded or condemned. It's your choice. But this is where he is. God's nature is self-giving love, which we see and is revealed in Jesus Christ over and over again. Accumulating on the cross and the resurrection, God's nature to heal and to forgive and to restore and to speak good news. Vengeance simply does not agree with who God is when you look at How he was revealed in Christ. Are you saying God never went to battle? Absolutely not. But we have to understand there's. I found this story and I thought it was kind of (coughs) neat. Excuse me. It's not really a story. It's it's an illustration. Sometimes we think God hurts us. Because he likes it. But there was an illustration that I found and talked about this. I'm going to read it in case I mess it up. It says, when a doctor resets a broken bone. Anybody ever broke a bone before? You ever had to have that bone reset? 
feels great, doesn't it? You just want to go do it right now. You want that under the Christmas tree. I understand. But when a doctor resets that bone, it's painful. I never broke a bone, but I broke my nose, which is nothing but cartilage. And then I dislocated my shoulder, tore all the ligaments in my shoulder. So I know what pain is. But he has the purpose to restore the bone to its original design and position. When a doctor looked at the bone and said, well, you know, I'm going, it's going to hurt. Count the three, bite down on this stick. I'm going to pull. You're going to feel some pain. But afterwards, it's going to go away and it's going to be back just like never before. Matter of fact, they say sometimes even those broken bones are stronger than the regular bones because more calcium develops around that wound. When a doctor begins to, to pull that bone and that leg or whatever it might be and he pulls it back into place, pain comes. But then the pain resides. A doctor does not punish someone for breaking their legs with unnecessary pain to teach them a lesson. A doctor, like the great physician, practices restoration even though there is pain involved in the process. The reality of Christmas. Every one of us, if we're walking and we're true Christians, we understand that sometimes walking with God brings us pain. Not from the outside sources, not from people stabbing us in the back, not from this, but from God himself trying to correct the things in our life that are starting to go away. There are some, uh, wait a second, you're breaking from protocol, you're breaking from the direction I'm asking you to go, I'm going to have to reset you. And when I reset you, you're not going to like it too much. It's going to cause you temporary pain and discomfort. But after that temporary pain and discomfort is gone, you're going to be okay. You're going to be better than new. Jesus gave us a giant clue about God's nature. When he responded to John's disciples or to anyone that asked who he was, I want you to understand that he is not mad at you. He is not punishing you. He is not sitting in heaven trying to keep a list of all the things you've done wrong. You know, some of of those that don't understand God Look at God as an old, angry man sitting in the clouds just waiting for you to do something wrong so he can put it on his list. You're going to pay for that one. Oh, you're going to pay double for that one. But in Scripture, you don't find that. You don't see a vindictive God waiting for you to mess up so you can pounce. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love channel, uh, the love channel, the, the, the love chapter, love keeps no record of wrong. Love keeps no, and if God is love, he's not keeping that record. He's not plotting and scheming against you. He is not disappointed in you. He does see your brokenness and he sees your mess and how you've been hurt or, or maybe how you have hurt somebody else. You know, sometimes the hurt that we have in our life is because we hurt first. Sometimes because we can't forgive, that pain comes back. Instead of punishing you, God is working in your life to heal the things that are broken. To cleanse the things that are impure. To restore you to your original design. Jesus did not come to change God's mind about us. Jesus did not come to change God's mind about us, but he did come to change our mind about God. You know, you, you could go to YouTube and watch all kinds of videos where you had street preachers and they're being confronted by homosexuals or they're being confronted by Muslims or, or confronted by this or that. And, and there, sometimes it's, it's, a, it's an okay argument, you know, they're arguing, but sometimes it just gets filthy and it's... And you can just see the devil coming out. You can see that the words are. But we have to understand. Jesus didn't come. So God said, well. Okay, you, you changed my mind about that person. The Bible says in John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We understand that he, he came because God loved us so much. He just... They don't understand who I am. Let me show them who I am through my son. You know, good and well, we sit around, we walk around, and we see somebody's kids, and we see how they're acting. And the first thing we do is say, whew, 
I wonder if mom and daddy are like that. Or, or how, how often have you dropped off your kids at somebody's house and you, and you begin asking them questions? So, was mom and dad there? Yeah. What was mom and dad doing? Were they outside drinking? Were they outside smoking? Were they outside doing this? Were they doing drugs? What was going on? Because you know mom and daddy are doing it. The kids are sure to be doing it too. Whatever the kids see the father do, they will do. That's why Jesus came. The reality of Christmas is God wanted to change our minds about who he was. It's easy for us to assign qualities to God that aren't part of his true character. Here's a simple way to know that God is like. This is who he is. All you have to do is look at Jesus. Look at the life and the teaching and the ministry, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. John 14 says, Jesus answered, do not, you do not know me, Philip. Even after I've been around you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? For Colossians says, the Son is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. John says, I and the Father are one. If you want to know who the Father is, all you have to do is look at Jesus Christ. He was telling him, I don't need to show you another picture. You're looking at the Father now because I'm doing everything he's asked me to do. They are one in purpose and one in character. God is exactly like Jesus. So if the character quality is not Christ-like, then it isn't of God. Maybe that's your little tweet, your, your meme, whatever it is you're going to put out. But that, Maybe that's the only thing you need to hear today. If the character quality is not Christ-like, it's not from God. If it's not from God, a child of God should not be participating in it. Being a part of it, condoning it, or anything of that nature. God sent his son to show us the way, but also to show us who he was. Jesus came to change our mind about God. In verse 7 of our text, after Jesus answered John's disciples and he sent them away, he turned and begins to speak to the crowd. Disciples, go back and tell John what you've seen and what you've heard. Then he turns around to the crowd. And he begins to talk to them. And he said, you know, why did you go out into the desert? Why did you go out looking for this prophet? Do you think he was going to be weak? Did you think this? Did you think that? What did you not see? You know that he is a great prophet. And I'm telling you, he is a great prophet here on earth. I'm paraphrasing. He's a great prophet. There's probably going to be no other prophet better than John and bigger than John the Baptist. However, I want you to understand this. The least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. You might not think you're anybody, but you're in the kingdom of God. You are greater than... There's something that John the Baptist never experienced that we do. He never experienced the forgiveness of sins. What do you mean, Pastor? It's John the... It's his cousin! What do you mean he hasn't been forgiven of his sins? John the Baptist died before Jesus did. The blood had not yet been shed for the forgiveness of sins. John was preaching and John was prophesying and he was, someday it's going to happen. He never saw that someday because his life was taken from him. But someday it happened. We live in an age of fulfillment, not anticipation. We get a closeness with God that the prophets never had. We get an abiding fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that no one ever experienced before Jesus. They heard from God. They spoke the word of God. They lived a holy life, but yet they never understood what it was to walk in fellowship with Jesus Christ. I'm speaking of the Old Testament prophets. They didn't understand what it was. But yet, we do. we've got something above them that they wish that they could experience. We can experience forgiveness of sins. We can experience a relationship with Jesus Christ. We can experience a love that there is absolutely no way to describe it. 
The reality of Christmas is we no longer have to anticipate what that day will be like or look like. Because that day is today. We live today understanding the reality of Christmas is God sent his son to change our mind about who he was so that he could come into our lives and change us. Isaiah spoke in chapter 61, and Jesus would speak it again in Luke chapter 4. The time will come when the answer will be present before you. Jesus stands up in front of the captives and the prisoners and proclaims their freedom. You know, sometimes Glenn and I talk about how sometimes scriptures have a double meaning. When you begin to look at this verse, it says in the Captives are set free. Depending on what version you, you, you read, you might miss some of what it says because another version says, the eyes of the blind are open. Jesus Christ came. So those that did not understand who God was, those that could not hear because their ears were deaf, Jesus Christ was going to open their ears and open their eyes and bring them out of the prison so they could understand the love of God was standing right before them. He speaks to you today. Your freedom is here. Freedom of not understanding him. You can be free from that. Freedom from condemnation. Freedom from isolation. You think you're by yourself. Freedom from the hurt that you have experienced or that you have caused on somebody else. You can be free from that today. Free from your dry season. Free from your destructive habits. The reality of Christmas started on a dark night in a manger. And that manger held every answer to every question that you would ever have in your life. The reality of Christmas it's not the night or the day that we anticipate and hope to experience, but it is a life that is available because God wanted to change our minds about Him. There's four things about the reality of Christmas that I want you to hear, and they're going to be very quick. The reality of Christmas is simply this. We get to experience, number one, forgiveness. No one before Christ heard the words, your sins are forgiven. Part of the Messianic hope was that God would, Jeremiah chapter 31 says, no longer would they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. We can just say hallelujah about that verse and go home and have the best day of our lives. God said, I will forgive their sins and remember them no more. This is future. I will. When you drop down to Romans chapter 8, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ because your sins are forgiven and he remembers them no more. If he remembers them no more, how can he condemn you for it? All the things that you fight in your mind is you. It's not him. Colossians chapter 2 says, when the dead in your sins and in the uncircumcised of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made public spectacle of them, triumphant over them by the cross. Every power of hell has been disarmed by Jesus Christ and the word of God says it that's why he says in Corinthians no weapon formed against me shall prosper because I have already taken all the power I've already disarmed it and I stand victorious and if you stand with me you will never face the enemy by yourself we think that we have to deal with this and deal with that I understand. Maybe I'm just a simple-minded individual from Georgia. But when the Word of God says that he has disarmed the enemy, I know that I could go into that fight and he has absolutely nothing he can use against me. 
Because Jesus Christ has already disarmed him, has already defeated him, and all I got to do is walk right through him. Maybe you think you had to do something else and bring something else to the battle or, or do this. But I don't know about you, but on a journey, I like to go as light as I possibly can. Because if I go as light as I possibly can, I won't use as much energy. My boys, you know, they're playing basketball, and the first thing they do when they go into a store to check out shoes, oh, this is nice, this is pretty, I like this color, nobody's got it, pick it up, oh, this is heavy, no way. I used to play flag football, and I would only wear Adidas Zeros, because most of those shoes weighed about seven ounces, which means I could play all day, and my legs aren't going to get tired, my feet aren't going to hurt, because I'm barely carrying anything other than my body weight. But when you have heavy shoes on your feet, after a little bit, it takes a little bit more muscle to pull that leg up. And as you're playing sports, if you don't pull that foot up all the way, you're about to face plant. Anybody ever walking and don't pull your foot up all the way and all of a sudden you, that toe grabs? What happens when we're walking with Jesus and that happens? The glorious forgiveness is not something of a future event. It is available today to everybody and is available every day. It's not for somebody, but it's for everybody. The second thing is, is the body of Christ. The reality of Christmas is we get forgiveness. The reality of Christmas is we have the body of Christ that we can live in. The church is a place of Christian community. And I know right now we're going to have some people buck the system. And they're going to say this and spew that and do this and do that. But we have to understand this. The body of Christ was created by God himself that we can come and we can grow and we can help each other in our time of need, bearing each other's burdens. Scripture, we have to bear, but the problem is, is sometimes we don't allow that to happen. A place where we can be loved and where you can love others with the self-giving love that God has poured into you. Why is it when we get involved in church, it quits being about him and starts being about us? It quits being about how can I serve him to why in the world are you stepping to my territory? You know I do this all the time. Get over there. Why are you sitting on my pew? People have gotten up and left the church because they had to sit in a different place and had to look at the church in a different angle i don't think it's happened here since i've been here but i've been in churches when it's happened they walk into i guess god's telling me i don't need to come today and walk right out what happened to that self-giving love that he has given us a place where you can be heard and a place where you can be valued. This type of loving and forgiving community has never existed before Christ. But we get to experience it if we want it. If we are, get ready, intentional about it. You have to be intentional about living a life of love around broken people. That all they're going to do is get on your first nerve. You know, everybody says the last nerve. I am so aggravating, I guarantee you I can get on your first nerve. I ain't going to worry about the last one. I'm going to hit you right, right off front. But we have to be intentional. Some people are here today. Some people are not here today. And there's been things going on. Then things hurting them and things hurting that and blah, blah, blah and blue, blue, blue. And all they can think about is they look in that mirror and says, how in the world are they allowing this to happen? And they forget the fact that they're there because of the love that Jesus poured into them. Oh, I know some of y'all talk behind my back. I don't care. Jose knows people talk behind his back. We're easy targets. <laughs> We're up here. There's only one pastor. There's only one senior pastor in each of our congregations. Me and voila him. It's a lot easier for the members to talk about us. I don't care. Because I'm being intentional. Pastor Jose's being intentional. 
You have to be intentional about your walk with Jesus Christ. You have to be intentional about showing the love of Christ in every aspect of your life, even when they're slapping you and spitting at you and saying everything you do is stupid and everything you do is dumb. You have no good ideas. You're not worth this. You're not worth that. Why are you even here? Man, I love you anyway. He's poured so much love in me. I can't, I can't not love you. Trust me, I'm trying to. But there's too much. I'm being intentional. The reality of Christmas is you have to be intentional. Because he was. He was. The last two is simply this. We get to experience forgiveness, the body of Christ, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize before Jesus Christ died, there was no internal dwelling of the Holy Spirit? That promise was not yet given. That promise was spoken by Jesus Christ to the disciples. I'm going to go and I'm going to leave you, but I will send a comforter. There's times you can read in Old Testament where the Spirit of God came down and sat on individuals and they performed miraculous feats. David, Samson, you can go on and on and on about how God sat upon them. Before the John the Baptist, there was no internal encounter with the presence of God, no abiding Holy Spirit to comfort and to teach. Psalms 41 says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. A Psalms of longing and unfulfillment. You go down to Ezekiel chapter 36. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities. From all your idols, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. The main purpose we are infilled and baptized with the Holy Spirit is not to speak in tongues. It's not to prophesy, but it is to allow God to move us to follow him in his decrees so that we can be careful to keep the laws that he has given us to follow. We have to understand, sometimes we get so skewed in our minds on the gifts that God has given us. One day, someday, God will make this happen. But John 7, the reality of Christmas gives us on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, Let everyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. They will, by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. The last thing is this. Amy, if you want to come play softly. I don't know. I think the box is over there. I'm not sure. We get forgiveness. We get the body of Christ. We get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we get the mind-blowing good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we get to share with anybody and everybody that understands the dialect that comes out of our mouth. We get to experience the gospel story. It's not just something that we do. We get to experience the good news of Jesus Christ. We get to live it every single day, the gospel of Jesus. We get to see in hindsight the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus whom went to the cross for me, for you. We get to experience the mind-blowing good news of the gospel. Colossians 1 says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. The reality of Christmas is simply this. Your transformation can start today. They will start to heal us today. They will start 
to restore us to the original design that God had for us today. The reality of Christmas is not for someday in the future. When you get right, when you think right, when you feel right, the reality of Christmas is today. Today, your freedom is possible. Today, your direction can be made clear. Today, your heart can be softened and restored. Today, you can experience Christmas the way it was meant to be experienced. Today, you can experience the reality of Christmas. There is something about understanding God and what He has for us and what He wants to accomplish in our life. I love Christmas. The lights, the trees, the magical reindeer, the big red sleigh, the gatherings, the songs, the gift exchange. I love everything about Christmas. What I love the most is no matter when or how much or what I see, when I see the lights on that tree, I think about the light that came into the darkness. When I see the gifts under a tree, I think about the gift that God gave me. When I hear the song, I just think about the angels singing that night in the field. When they begin to raise a joyful sound because the, the Messiah had been born. Oh yeah, we can water everything down. Oh yeah, we can get cluttered. Come, come Friday night, next Friday night. Well, this coming Friday night and, and watch the play. You're going to see Blake. He's just all jacked up in his head. Hates Christmas. But there's something about when the reality of Christmas gets into your heart. It's like the water that he said that he's going to provide. You know the thing I hate about water? It needs the smallest crack. And it can go anywhere it wants to. Don't make a difference. The smallest crack. You know how many times Pastor Jose and myself have been chasing roof leaks? We think we got it going. It's like, oh, man, not again. I almost think that we can have a cement roof, and we still going to find a roof leak somewhere. And like they say, a roof leak is the hardest thing to find because as soon as the water gets in, it's going to go wherever it wants to. It's not going to drop where it came. It's going to run down the wood, run down the rafters. Squirrels are going to take it wherever it wants to go. But when you think about the reality of Christmas, all God needs is a small crack in your hardened shell for His Word to get in there and change you from who you are to who He created. If everybody would stand. Again, I don't want anybody leaving. Brother Rick, if you'll make yourself available, I'm going to... Thank you for watching. We hope today's message has inspired and transformed your life. Want to watch past sermons? Visit our YouTube page. Just search for Maranatha Fellowship Baton Rouge. And don't forget to like our Facebook page to stay up to date on any upcoming events. God bless and have a great day.